teaching for about 14 years. And for the majority of my career, I would consider myself probably a very traditional educator. This is what my classroom looked like for the majority of that time. My students tended to sit in straight rows facing the front because I was the one who was usually talking. Um, I directed the show. I decided what we were learning, when we were learning it, how we were going to learn it, what the assignments would be, what books we would be reading, when the exam would be, and of course, there would be an exam. Essentially, I was the master of the universe <laughs> in a very small domain. And to be honest, I taught like that because that's what I knew. That's the way I was taught. When I think about my elementary and my high school career, that's how I learned. My university, even though I was training to be a teacher, it was largely that as well. And to be honest, it didn't occur to me that there could be another way to do it. And so I replicated what I saw in the classrooms of the teachers that I worked with when I was learning to be a teacher. And it wasn't until my master's degree, when I was, I was working on a master's in ed tech and design, and I took a, a class with Dr. Alec Kuros. And that class changed my life. To be honest, when I was taking it with it, it almost killed me. But it changed my life. It wasn't about technology, although at the same time it was. It was about pedagogy. And I started learning about things like student-centered learning and constructivism and inquiry and PBL. And for the first time, I began to realize that maybe my students could construct their learning that learning is constructed in community, and that maybe they could be the center of it, maybe they would have something to say about it. And so one day, as I'm walking to class, I decided that I was going to ditch my lesson plan. And that was not something I did. <laughs> I am not a fly by the seat of my pants teacher. I always knew exactly where we were going. And I'm thinking, as I'm walking up to you know, I had this kind of little podium because I was a science teacher. So, you know, I was a master of the universe with a podium. How much better does it get? As I'm walking up, I'm thinking, I don't have to do this. I have a lesson. I can just teach that. I don't have to do this. Nobody will know any better. And so as I stood at the front of the room looking at my students, I said, if you could design school to be anything you wanted it to be, what would it look like? What would it sound like? What would I hear? What would, it, what would I see? What would it feel like? What would you be doing? And when they realized I was serious, <laughs> they began to write. And they wrote, and they wrote, and they wrote. And they giggled, and they laughed, and they chattered, and they wrote with such passion. And then we began to talk. And really, <laughs> although they did not say that, that was the bottom line. You know, they said things quite kindly like, we don't mind that you lecture, but maybe not quite so much. <laughs> and, you know, can we sit on the floor and hear what each other has to say? And so we actually reconfigured our classroom so that we had this huge space probably this size in the middle, and they all had these learning pods that we created on the outside, and we always sat in a circle in our classroom so that we could discuss. And I found out during this process that my students wanted to make a difference. And it turns out at the time that they had been learning about the wars that had been happening in Uganda and how children had been enslaved as soldiers, and the schools had been destroyed. And my kids really wanted to do something. And so I said, OK, well, you know what? We need to, we need to do some research. 
We need to know what we're dealing with. We need to know what would really make an impact. And so the next day, we went down to the computer lab, and we were researching. And about halfway through the class, one of my students comes bounding down the stairs and says to me, OK, I know this research thing is like really important, but can we actually do something? And I said, sure. What do you want to do? And so she starts telling me about this thing that she had found, this schools for schools competition. And she's rattling off all this information. And now she's telling me, I bring up the web page, and I plug in our information. And then basically, at the same time that she finishes telling me all about this, I hit submit. And I said, OK, we're signed up. And she looks at me, and she says, really? <laughs> Absolutely. And so she turns around, and she starts shouting to the class that we're part of this competition. And yeah, and awesome. And they're all excited, and they're texting and telling people. And I'm thinking, this is going to be awesome. You know, we'll raise a couple thousand dollars. My kids will feel like they're important. This will be great. And so the next day, we come back to school. And it was a Friday. And my students come back to class, and they say to me, Mrs. Wright, we have decided on a goal. And I said, awesome, what is it? We have decided that we want to raise $10,000. And inside my, set, in my head, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, do you have any idea how much money $10,000 is? And my outside voice said, that's awesome. <laughs> how do you propose we do that? And they're like, oh, well, there's this thing called Change for Change. And basically, yeah, make all these you know, change jars, and you put them around the city, and people can put change in them, and you can raise money. And you have to realize, I'm from Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, that has a grand total with, you know, probably if you included all of our cats, 35,000 people. So you're going to need a lot of change jars to raise $10,000. But I'm like, OK, that sounds like a terrific start. So they start planning, and it was great. And then we left for the weekend. And the thing about learning, when it's something that your students have decided to do, is it doesn't stay in the walls of your classroom. It takes on a life of its own. And you don't necessarily control it anymore. And it just so happened that that weekend at a drop-in center in Moose Jaw, that there were kids from Uganda who had gone to the schools that had been rebuilt by this organization. And my kids heard them and heard how their lives had been changed. And they met them, and they talked to them. And my kids were deeply impacted. And so unbeknownst to me, all of this happened on the weekend, and they came back Monday. And they said to me, Mrs. Wright. And they told me the whole story, and they said, we've decided to change our goal. <laughs> and I'm thinking, we ain't going lower, are we? <laughs> and they said, we have decided we are going to raise $20,000. And in my head, I'm thinking, oh my gosh. Where I come from, that's a down payment on a house. <laughs> like, you have no idea how much money that is. And I think that was the brilliance behind it, to be honest. I think if it was adults, we would have struck a committee, and we'd still be there figuring out how to make this happen, and we wouldn't have raised a cent. But kids aren't like that. And I said, OK, well, $20,000. How do you propose we do that? And that began the roller coaster of the next 45 days, because that's how long we had to raise this money. So we had the change for change jars. And then you know, we decided, well, you know, how about we have a roast beef dinner in an auction? And so they began planning all that. We called the caterer. They started you know, doing all the details for that. It turns out that the kid who went around the city to get every auction item was a kid who never spoke in class. And to me, that was shocking. This was so far out of his comfort zone, but it was something he deeply believed in that he decided to do it. And so there were these high moments, like you know, the roast beef dinner, where we raised 
$7,000 in one evening. And there were times where it's like, okay, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. And then we planned a benefit concert and we were going to, you know, we had all these musicians lined up and it was on a Sunday at the end of November on the same day and year that the riders made it into the Grey Cup. <laughs> no benefit concert. Here's in Saskatchewan, that's a really big deal. <laughs> and so it's like, okay, well, how do we compensate for that? Okay, well, how about we hold a barbecue? And we did at the beginning of, beginning of December on a day when it was 40 below. <laughs> and it turns out that the barbecues are stored outside and that if you do that, the propane tanks will freeze. And so we had half a barbecue to barbecue 300 hamburgers and hot dogs. And it was a nightmare from beginning to end. And partway through, one of my students looked at me and she's like, oh, Mrs. Wright, this is so terrible. Everything's falling apart. You know, we have to figure out how to fix this. And I looked at her and I said, have you ever planned a wedding? <laughs> I said, trust me, you're going to need these skills. <laughs> and so at the end of 45 days, it was a Friday, our total was $15,000 and change. And I thought, that's not bad. I mean, we had about 25 kids. It was more than their first goal. We didn't quite reach a second goal. And to be honest, I was somewhat disappointed. But I left class thinking we did a good thing. But the truth is, the story wasn't over. Because during that time, my kids had actually split up into teams. They just created them themselves. We had a finance team, we had a PR team, we had, you know, fundraising teams. And I would literally walk into class and say, so what are we doing today? And they would tell me. Some of the kids who had done the PR had been interviewed by the radio station numerous times. And the DJ there knew what my kids were trying to do in their goal. And so he went on to their web page that day that showed our total, and he knew their goal was $20,000. And so that afternoon, he got on the radio and began asking people to donate to help my kids reach their goal. And the crazy thing is, people did. By 6 o'clock, we were sitting at $19,000. And there was a live stream wrap-up party that was being held in San Diego by the organization that was doing this. And, you know, they saw this little city of Moose Jaw shoot out of nowhere to have $19,000. And through social media, they were actually able to get a hold of two of my students. And my kids told them what our goal is, $20,000. And so the people at the live stream party got on the live stream and asked people to donate to help my kids reach their goal. And the crazy thing is, people did. And so by the end of it, my students had raised $22,824 American at a time when we were not on par. We lost almost 10 cents for every dollar we raised. That day, I learned to believe in my students, to believe in what really deeply matters to them, and to remove whatever obstacles I can to try to make that happen. More importantly, my students learned to believe in themselves. They learned that they can make a difference they had a saying the entire 45 days, we are not the future, we are right now. And my students learned that there is a world out there so much bigger than them that cares about the things that they care about and the kindness of strangers to help them meet a goal that they deeply, deeply wanted. Our schools need to be places that set our kids' hearts on fire, 
that they can figure out what they are passionate about, where we give them opportunities to pursue it, and that we can give them a place to make a difference now. One of the things that I've learned over and over from doing this kind of stuff with my students is that our students will often exceed our expectations of them if we only give them the opportunity. Thank you.